All right, so that's some, we've got some good updates there um, on folks. Uh, let's be praying for, for Joyce who fell. Um, and uh, Ann Pebbles, who I, has anybody talked to Ann this week? I called her yesterday, and you and I are both like losers. Pastor Bill, she's be doing, <laughs> she's doing great. Yeah. She's only taking Tylenol and aspirin, yeah. and she is using you know, her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> I know. They, 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 uh, she's going up I'm, stairs. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Way to go, Ann. <laughs> Shocker, <laughs> showing us all up. <laughs> that's right, losing. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Oh, well, we'll speak of Joyce. Is that Joyce? Here she is. No, no, if Joyce asked to come in, I just pressed it. Yeah. Here, but she, I'll, I'll tell her to turn on her video. I hope she can I hope she can can do it. So yeah, so that's great to hear about Ann doing. Um let's see. I think that's the scoop. So let's pray and we'll get we gotta we gotta get moving in Luke here. There's Joyce. Yay! Joyce! <laughs> we were just talking. Oh here, you guys, let me ask you to unmute too. There you go. Sometimes help people. Okay. There you go. We can. Yeah, we were just. So. Yeah, I we are praying recovering well. I hope us? so. <laughs> I hope yeah. so. Yeah, I'm so sorry. What what did you bring? Me too. <laughs> Two weeks ago. And wh how? what did you break? Was it hand, arm, shoulder? My hand, hand, two bones in my hand. I just barely got out of the shower. <laughs> oh. oh, it's tough. I'm telling you. I have a good partner, though. Yes. Yes, That's I these do. things that make us appreciate that. Don't, don't they yeah. certainly do. They certainly yeah. do. Thank you for oh. thanking them. Yeah, well, lots of prayers. I was gonna I, when I heard you fall, I heard you fell last week and I didn't get I didn't get a call in you. I was thinking about you. So yeah. No problem. All right. Well, so glad you can chime in via via the internet today. That's perfect. Yeah. So um yeah, the big thing that's obviously going on, we got Vacation Bible School. And so after we get done, you know, check check it out what the kids have been doing. It's a lot, really exciting. So, all right, well, let's pray. Hey, thank you for those at home and here in person for this Bible study to be together. Um, bless us this day with your, your Holy Spirit through your word as we work through these sayings of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. And for those who came in just recently, we're going to have to skip next week. Um, Sue Bernhardt's gravesite is on Thursday, and I'll be traveling up there um, to Linden to do that. So that's going to take most of the day. So anyway, um, that's just enough. Let's share up the screen. And now, we're going to do a little stitch. Now, and and I'm, I'll be honest, skipping some of the stuff that's a little hard. <laughs> So I know fair, but where we were um, is we had finished uh, back here, you know, um, yeah. Uh, yes, there we go. If, if you're not, whoever's not, not with me is against me, et cetera. So we finished that. So we get this, uh, a word about an unclean spirit that comes back. Um, that, that it can be worse than the, now I'm going to sneeze. Hold on, everybody. Huh. 
I've been taking lots of rapid COVID tests to make sure I don't have COVID. So it's been all clear. So um, so there's this interesting, you know, it can the state of the person is worse than the first. In other words, so what you, you know, if you empty if, what what loves a vacuum, power loves a vacuum or something like that. Well, you don't want to just get rid of something, you want to get things filled up. And that's why we want Christ in us. What what is true be, being blessed is hearing the word of God and keeping it. And so, uh, you know, it's interesting to dig down to what it means to keep it. Is it to do it? Yes, but it is to believe it, hear it, and believe it is ultimately the way you keep the word. Uh, the sign of Jonah um, about this generation wants a sign. They're only going to get the sign of Jonah. What might that be? Well, Jesus' death and resurrection. Then we get some talk about lighting a lamp. You don't put a light. So this... This is kind of Luke's, uh, he brings a lot of stuff to you that is in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and so this is a section, remember he's headed to Jerusalem, and so now we get all, all kinds of saying um, about shining the light, and now he gets into a battle with Pharisees and the lawyers. Um, so they ask, so I think it might be enough to, to start, but basically, um, we won't start reading yet. We'll keep, we're going to skip some more just so we can get some distance here. Uh, so the Pharisees ask him to dine with them and, and they recline at table. That's also a fun historical thing. They didn't have chairs in Jesus's day. You know, the last supper, they were not at a table like uh, da, da Vinci, you know, uh, painted, but they were probably, you know, sitting on the floor and table would be something that would be on the floor um so that's that's the way they were would would have dinner so um but the pharisees get upset because he doesn't walk before dinner and so now we start getting into a battle and woe to you pharisees you know and so he calls them hypocrites in other words and you killed the prophets and all this that's not a nice thing to do when you go over to dinner is it <laughs> But they asked him there to totally trip him up. So that's important to say. Um, and they now are provoking many things against him, lying in wait for him to catch him in something that he might say. Um, but in the meantime, when so many thousands, so this we'll pick up with chapter 12 here. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is what? Hypocrisy. The word in Greek for hypocrisy, that's what you called an actor. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a, a hypocrite was an actor on the stage, you know. So, so in other words, a, a pretender, somebody that's just acting something out. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. This is a scary statement. <laughs> um, We've got our rights to privacy, and that's good. But, and then, you know, in the world, you know, people are always like, well, they got away with it. And they, you know, we, you know, all these secrets and all these things, and we don't know what happened, you know, what the truth is sometimes, but God does. Um, and uh, it's all, it's going to be revealed. So if you're a pretender, um, you know, it's, it's going to be revealed. So, that's both good news and bad news. Uh, it's good news to know that, I suppose, so that the, all the pretenders, are, you know, are going to get revealed. But then, what if I'm one of them? <laughs> um, I love the, I love the, the response when people say, "Oh, I don't go to church because it's filled with what hypocrites." And I and I always say, "Well, there's room for one more." So that's my that's my reply. So. Um, but I think there's a sense that sometimes people think they get away with stuff. And in this world they do, but you know, God knows the heart. So so let's not be worrying about other people's hypocrisy. Let's be worried about ours. Be worried, be beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. 
In other words, beware of that seed, that that leaven that you know sprouts hypocrisy. And I think, what is that leaven? What do you think the leaven of the of, of the Pharisees, which which is hypocrisy? Um, you know, uh, no, I, I that is. Um, I guess for me, it's like. I don't know if it's a lack of sincerity. I don't know. Well, one lie leads to another. Thing. You have to cover up the first lie to tell him to another lie to cover mm -hmm. up the first lie, and before you know it, you've dug a hole. So yeah. You so it is. And it, yeah, dishonesty. dishonesty. Yeah. I think the the you know, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees would be that well, we're we're sons of Abraham, so we've got it made. Yeah. So we're set. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Judgment. A judgment of others. Yeah. And we're also not only are we set, we're better than everybody else. Yeah. 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 Stephanie, were you going to say? Well, maybe they say one thing and they do it. Right. Yeah. Say one thing and don't do it. Do another. Yeah. I, I mean, you had to go and love the fellowship when um, they, when yeast is mentioned in the New Testament, the image of it is you take just a tiny little bit of it and it, Right. Double your breath, right? Double your breath. So just a little tiny bit can cause a lot. Cause everything to, you know, go. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, the Jews are very, you know, because of the Passover. You know, um, was that when we were there? Was when we went to Israel? Yeah. Were we, that was Passover. That one year we went. Yeah, we had leftovers because nobody. Could yeah, because the yeah. kitchens were all being scrubbed down. So that there's no leaven anywhere, you know, because leaven just yeah. just 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 goes, you know, it's in the air. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. And let the air go. And that's your sourdough. Yeah. Yeah. So so they scrub everything, they clean everything to get rid of all leaven and this type of thing. But so it's a powerful image. Yeah. I think um. I think for me, true repentance is the opposite of hypocrisy. You know, sometimes people say to me about the confession of forgiveness, well, people are just going through the motions. And I always say, I don't know. How do you know? Um, uh, it's in the person's heart. And so you don't know, but God knows. There you go. What we used to say, we still do occasionally, but in the old LBW, um, God in whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts. Yeah. Let's acknowledge that, yeah. Yeah, it is. I think we'll we'll do that. Um, so then a statement about, I tell you friends, do not fear this whole thing about not fearing the ones who can um, harm the body, but fear the one, um, uh, or no, this isn't that one, okay. Um, do not fear those who kill the body and after have nothing more that they can do, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he has been killed has the authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies and not one of them is for, forgotten before God? Why even the hairs of your head are numbered? Fear not, you are more value than many sparrows. So, so there's, this is just a saying, we get all these things smattered in here. But this is an interesting one, isn't it? Um, if he knows the number of hairs on your head, you sure can't hide anything from him. You can't hide anything <laughs> from him, yeah. I, I'll never, I, this is, you know, you have these memories that come back. So at Christ Church Lutheran in Phoenix, Arizona, 40th Street Newman School, um, thereabouts, uh, there was a grocery store just like next to our really large congregation and and uh, and a drugstore and for some reason my brother and I mom sent my brother and I over to get something I don't know to buy something and I said something about it was we were in the hair aisle or something and I said something like well God doesn't care about that and and there was a very pious Missouri Synod <laughs> lady there who stopped us and said. God cares about every one of your hairs, and He knows every one of your hairs. And I'm like, oh. yeah. Every time I read this, I can. I'm right back in that grocery store, drugstore. 
with this, you know, with their hat on and everything. Anyway, um, so, but there's a sense that there's something more to worry about than those who can harm us physically. That's powerful. And then this promise here that you're, you are more value than many sparrows. Take heart. So, you know, you, so there, you get this sense that maybe Jesus is talking to his disciples who are going to undergo persecutions. You know, that, and even if you do, that doesn't mean that God doesn't care about you. Some of these sound like Proverbs. Like yeah, yeah. Th this whole section, it's like they're loosely connected sayings. Um, although this one here then, you know, Jesus um, talks about, you know, acknowledging him before other people. Well, let's just read this. And I tell you that everyone who acknowledges me before men, the son of man, also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So there's your unforgivable sin. And when the, they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Interesting. Again, I think Jesus is kind of preparing his disciples for you're going to run into a lot of opposition you know, if you acknowledge me before men, you're, you're going to be acknowledged. You deny me, you're going to be denied by the angels of God. But then there's even the forgiveness. Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, Jesus will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So that's the question. What does that mean? What does it mean to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? I think in Mark, it, there's it's it's the unforgivable thing is like saying Jesus is from the devil and not from God. Um, here, you know, blasphemes against the Holy Spirit. We've got a couple Bible references. You know, so resisting the only, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant, which, which has outraged the spirit of grace? That's just some, some cross references that the ESV puts in there. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? What is the what is blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? Should we get a commentary up here and see what they say? Okay, uh, so what this commentary is saying, by the way, is this: these proverbs, Audrey, we find these in Matthew and Luke. And so a lot of people believe that because they're very similar, Matthew and Luke, that there might have been a written source that both Matthew and Luke had that we don't have anymore. It's a, it's a conjecture. That's what this Q thing is. Um, with two other traditional sayings of Jesus concerning the sin against the Holy Spirit and the promise of the assistance of the Holy Spirit. All the material is traditional, but Luke offers a further exposition of the connection between the confrontation with the human courts of judgment and divine court, like Isaiah 6. Before him, Luke's picture of this heavenly court is enhanced with the attending angels of God. Uh, Matthew 10, 32, Jesus speaks in the first person, everyone who confesses me, I will confess. Everyone who denies me, I will deny. In Luke, the subject of the second clause is the son of man. Everyone who acknowledges me, the son of man also will acknowledge. Everyone who denies me will be denied. Perhaps Luke is merely reciting the tradition and all that is meant is that the Son of Man is a synonym for Jesus. The term Son of Man is also used in two similar passages in Luke, where it is lacking in Matthew. In Matthew 6, the term Son of Man is dropped from the Mark material. Okay, that's fine. In Luke, the term Son of Man is more than a synonym for I. Since the role of the Son of Man is judgment, is so crucial in the whole context. As will become clear in 1724 through 25, which says that, talking about his own suffering, Jesus is the Danielic son of man in Luke's gospel. Thus, Luke would not object to understanding that these references to the son of man mean Jesus, but this is Jesus in a specific role. 
as the eschatological judge of all things. Dan from Daniel. Yeah, from Daniel. Kind of so in Daniel, there's a passage about I saw one like the Son of Man. Yeah. So there's this figure in Daniel that you know it's kind of mysterious. A lot of people look back and say, well, that, that's the second person of the Trinity, you know, and and I think there's good reason to think that. And so when Jesus talks about himself as son of man, what this commentator is saying is that Jesus is, you know, saying, I'm that Danielic son of man who's and that person in Daniel is the judge uh, at the end times type of thing. Um, Christians are called to speak out and testify to invest you probably in public context or trial. The synagogue rules are this consistent. Okay, the most complex and difficult aspect of this text is the distinction between assurance of forgiveness may be given even for speaking a word against the Son of Man while blaspheming the Holy Spirit is unforgivable. Within Luke Acts, Peter's threefold denial of Jesus causes great remorse. Jesus denied the Son of Man, right? I mean, Jesus, Peter. Um, Peter denied this. Yeah, Jesus denied himself. No, no. Um, um, within Luke Acts, Peter's threefold enough, but Jesus already anticipated his turning again when he predicted Peter's denial. On the other hand, Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead for lying to God and tempting the spirit of the Lord. That's in Acts. That's that kind of really interesting, uh, a little bit strange where they, they lie and they withhold stuff and they're struck dead. And Simon the magician verged close to the unforgivable sin by trying to buy the power or gift of receiving the Holy Spirit. In Mark, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is understood to be committed by those who charge Jesus with having an unclean spirit. I talked about that. In Matthew, speaking against the Holy Spirit is the unforgivable sin. Okay, so what does it mean? Tell us, in Luke, where dynamic character of the Spirit's role is so thoroughly developed, it appears that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is committed by the misuse of the power of the Spirit or the challenge of the power of the Spirit. These are not merely problems of disciples failing to fulfill the commission, but attempts to usurp and co-opt the authority and power of the Holy Spirit. All right, we finally got to it. After all of that... So um, perhaps this commentator would say it's using the power of the Holy Spirit, not for good and for the gospel, but for the opposite. My Bible says in footnote that if you read about that, you're... yeah, right. If you're worried about blasting the Holy Spirit. You're, you're. Why, why is that? Well, the Holy Spirit convicts you. So, yeah, yeah. Um, that's another great, uh, I know I've said this many times, but when you're, if you are ever counseling, supporting a friend or family member who's really hurting and they're upset about something they've done, or maybe they're getting close to the end of their life and they feel like, I didn't measure up, you know, I'm in trouble, you know, you, you know, our typical response is, well, God forgives you. And that's true, and that's good. You should do that. But sometimes it doesn't work because they, they don't think that God's spirit is in them. But that's where just what your note said, Gloria, is the perfect thing. You know what? I, I'm glad you feel bad. That means the Holy Spirit's in you. So now listen up. You are forgiven in the name of Jesus. You know, and they go, oh, really? Yeah. So because so, sometimes people don't get that the Holy Spirit, when you're feeling like Wow, I've missed the mark. That's a sign the spirit is in you. So perfect, perfect glory. Yeah. So I, I like this definition of um, blaspheming the Holy Spirit to pervert and use the power of the spirit to for for not, you know, good, but evil, I guess you could say. And that does seem to be bear up in that. So I, I suppose it could be giving them giving Satan credit when it's sure right right yeah because you hear satan worshipers you know yeah yeah okay so um let's do the rich the parable of the rich fool because this won't have any any anything to say to us at all 
We're not rich or fool. So let's move on. No. <laughs> Let's run from this parable. <laughs> Someone in the crowd said, and teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Okay. That's kind of a countercultural word for us, is it not? And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store up my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, have ample, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. All right, this is a great parable. What strikes you? What do you want to say about this? Cool parable. Greed. Yeah. Greed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, you know, this right here is maybe something us in the so called first world need to hear. You know, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Do, do, does Jeff Bezos know this? Maybe. I don't know. Remember years ago, that was a bumper sticker that the he who dies with the most toys wins. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not. <laughs> yeah. I think a little bit of a comes on your perspective. If you've been really poor and you finally aren't destitute for each meal, you have a little different feeling about saving up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, that's that's where you know yeah because what rich and that's a that's a subjective thing you know um, I don't consider myself rich but probably by most people in this world standards I am rich well, yeah, yeah we all are yeah but I in this my context I wouldn't put myself in the rich no. group but probably am so um, and then yes once you've really been you know not sure where your next meal comes from. You feel rich when you're not in that food insecurity place anymore. You know, you may not have, you know. So that's a, that's a great point. I, I self-centered, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> because it's all I, I, I. Yes. Did you notice how many times? And that's clearly a part of Jesus' teaching here. Um, how many times does the word I appear? We notice how many times. Yes. Couldn't help but do that. I am nowhere. So in that regard, uh, again, Kenneth Bailey and some other Middle Eastern scholars would tell us that in villages in Jesus' day and to this day in Mediterranean world, you didn't make decisions on your own. So us as Westerners, you know, well, we, we might, I might ask my wife or my husband or I might ask some, a friend, but we kind of, we make, we, make, we make the call. In the Middle Eastern context, that's just bizarre. You would never do that. You would get together at the gate and you'd say, hey, I got all this, I got this issue. What do you all think? And everybody would chime in and talk and work it through. And you'd get everybody on board and you'd get a consensus about what to do, especially in a large family. For someone in a large family in the Middle East to just decide, oh, I'm leaving, I'm going to wherever. Um, that, that's just unheard of. But what do you notice about this guy? He doesn't have anyone to talk to but himself. So he, he's he gone astray long before this moment. He doesn't have any, um, he, he doesn't have any, um, anybody to talk to. He only talks to his soul. Yeah, he talks to his soul, himself, me, myself, and I. So, um, 
So he's already a very lonely person. So how he has lived up to this point has led to this point where now he doesn't have anybody to turn to. He also doesn't have anybody to share it with, you know. And and notice he doesn't um, he doesn't think about wow this is so cool. I I would hope if I've got if I had all this access I'd be like man who can I give this away to or how can I help you know um, and I see that with so many in our congregation who have that kind of look view of their wealth and their treasure. Probably giving it to the local food bank. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Why not? You know. I've always thought it's crazy that he was to tear down the building and build a larger one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why not just build a larger one next to the one they already had? <laughs> you know, like, what's my doing with all this right. or, and then the large Yeah. Bit. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or just pass it up, um, give it out. Give it out. Just share it. Yeah. Um but here is this very your life is Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> that would be death. Yeah. That okay, you you your your it's time for your soul, your life to go back to God. God's given you life here on earth and now and what are you gonna do with it? And so your translation, Roberta says life. Yeah. Yeah. It's and this is the word um, su psyche, soul, or life. It's that's the, the Greek word is psyche. Um, and and uh, probably the Hebrew would be nesep. But um, I still don't know who that is back, back there, background and stuff. Hmm, everybody's muted. Okay. So, um, yeah. Oh, that's VBS stuff. Yeah. And okay. I was like, what's going on? Um, so, um, yeah, so this is a fascinating parable um, about, but notice the conclusion, because you could look at it and say, well, wealth is bad, but is that a correct conclusion from this parable? No. The one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. If you're rich toward God, then you're seeing what you have as a loan from God. What are you going to do with it? Yeah, you're going to use it for God. Yeah. So this is a great parable. Um, I don't think this is saying you shouldn't have a pension fund or you shouldn't have a 401k or, you know, or whatever. Um, some people look at it that way. Though. Um, some people look at it like, hey, we're all concerned about our retirements and stuff. And there's all these needs and stuff. But for me to take care of my retirement, if I'm blessed to have you know that much time um, is re responsible. I don't want to be a burden to my community or my family, so that's why I do that. Um, and I think that's different than being like, oh, let me just lay up more treasures for myself. We live in a very different system than they did back then. You know, you didn't have to. You know, you had a village that took care of you. You know, there weren't savings accounts and stuff like this. Most people. So, but you were taken care of because the family and the village took care of you. That was the social security or the, you know, um, but in our economic situation, in our, you know, it makes sense to, to do what you can so that you've got, you know, something to keep you going <laughs> when you get a little older. So, um, so I don't, I don't see it that way, but I do see it's not, what does it mean to be rich toward God? Um, and for me, I would define that as, uh, a sense of that I'm blessed to be a blessing. That's being rich towards God. God has blessed me. I've got all the goods, you know, and now I'm going to, I'm going to share them. So, and I, and, yeah. I have a um, teacher of faith. That's kind of yes. And they're a, they're a vehicle for retirement. Is really um, right. Yes, that's right. And, and so they're trying to hold up that, Yes, be a good, a good steward and then live generously with what you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. I was listening to NPR on way in, and um, the story was about unintended consequences of the of COVID, sort of some good that's come out of it. We're feeding programs for over the summer and for school lunch for the children, where they were all, it was all free. And that there's a problem with stigma with kids that have to. Uh, give a different color ticket or plug in a different code or something to get their free lunch. Mm -hmm. And none of that happened. Everybody got free lunch. 
And now, of course, they want to take that. But, but the, the unintended consequence of it was how these kids flourished. Yeah. Being fed. In the, and so and during I the summer that, in particular, yeah. Yeah. So if we share, that's what we, that's what happens is that our community flourishes. Exactly. Like yeast. Yeah. 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 Like what, what, what kind of yeast is it? It does grow. Absolutely. And um, our, like Paul always says about the wilderness story, you know, manna spoils if you, if you try and keep it. So you, you want to share it. And then that's, yeah, no, that's, that's really helpful. Yeah. It is about a flourishing and, 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 and there's plenty out there if, as we share it and support people and help them flourish. So, and I see that happening so much in our congregation. It's so exciting to see. Um, what's that? The book. The book, yes. The, the, um, the Bridging the Gap program that we started, which just to review or recall your memory, it actually started with my wife telling me about a study that she came across in all of her stuff that the achievement gap for kids in poverty or lower income um, happens in the summertime. So kids that are out of more wealthy homes, they do all this enrichment and summer camp and study and all these things. And so they their reading just keeps going up over the summer. Kids in a more middle-class situation, it pretty much stays the same. And lower income, every summer it drops down. And you add that up by seven, eight years, and you've got the achievement gap. And so one of the studies showed that, it, but if you give these kids who are in lower income situations, you don't just give them books, but you give them the ability to pick out like 12, 15 books to read over the summer. Guess what happens to that drop? It stays the same. So I told Kathy Bowman, our community connector, about this study, and that birth are going now into three or four schools. We, you know, and they're not Christian books. They're just they're reading lists. They're 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 their public school books. And at the end of each year, it's second graders. So it's just we're hoping. I would love it if every church like, oh, we're going to do that too. <laughs> and um, so we go in, we get all the books, the kids come in and they pick out their books for the summer. And it's the cool, one of the coolest things to see in life. One of the kids, now this is pre COVID, but um, he said, I remember him distinctly saying, this is the best day of my life. Just to be able to pick out 15 books to take home and read all the summer. So, sure, Drivent does a lot of, well, we use all these uh, choice dollars and and then your action teams and stuff but but that's the type of thing we want to do yeah yeah and it's interesting uh, something i can share uh, i don't think this is a secret or anything but on one of the school's like facebook pages a parent was taking issue with uh, with like what is a church coming in and doing because they were worried you know like and and um and, you know, it's fine. It was a good question. Uh, and like, I don't know, I'm not a Lutheran household. So who are these people? And, you know, it was, it was kind of, and, and so we thought, well, should we read a response? We didn't need to. All the parents in the school just chimed in. I want to go to that church. That's fantastic. And they just started to say, they just, so, so it was really cool. And this just happened in one of the schools. So, you know, that's what you do. You shine the light and you share what you've been given. So yeah, Jerry, yeah. We just think that what church is doing is that there should be some Christian books that they can choose from. Yeah, yeah. The, it shouldn't be just stuck there. Yeah, well, it's 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 there. If we did that, then we would be, but this is what we do do. We do have things given by Silverdale. So we do, there is an invitation or let, we let them know who's doing this. So may, hopefully that will open the doors. So, um, but yeah, I don't think, although with now with the new Supreme Court ruling, I don't know, but I don't think we could have done that before, but um, yeah, but I know where you're coming from. So, yeah. So, okay, excellent. Um, this is interesting. Fear not, little flock, 
For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, sell your possessions and give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in, in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And this is something obviously we've talked a lot about. I know Kim's got this uh, um, memorized from all of our conversations and um, so we want to focus in on that. So, so it's it's just reiterating what we've already learned in this parable and what we've already said. Uh, you know, in Jesus's day, you could sell your possessions and give money to the poor. It's a little bit different than today. But yeah, we want to care for the poor. But how we do that is a challenge. It's a it's way we're in a way more complex situation than what they were in the in the first century. Um, you know, uh, what program do we support? What, you know, <laughs> what do we what do we do? These are all kind of challenging questions, but nonetheless, there's still that call to do that. But then Jesus throws on a little bit of an added twist at the end here. What do we typically say? We typically say for where your heart is, there where your treasure will be. In other words, where you put your treasure shows where your heart is. And there's some truth to that, because what what I do with my money shows what I value. Like I remember one pastor saying, you know, if you want to look at your stewardship, you know, get your checkbook out. Where's your money going? You know, <laughs> and how much is going, you know, to just for you and how much is going to care for others or the church, et cetera. And, the, and that, that's a, it's a good little, you know, but, but that's, that's actually not what Jesus says. What he says is much more hopeful and much more exciting. He says, where you put your treasure, that's where your heart will be. So, of course, you've heard me talk about this a million times. You know, what is Disney telling you to do? Follow your But what if your heart's not in a good spot? What if you're a sinful person by nature? Maybe you shouldn't follow your heart. <laughs> Following your heart is no guarantee that you're going to do something good, you know? How do we know that the people stealing money aren't following their heart? <laughs> so, but I understand what Disney's saying, you know. But, but actually what Jesus is saying is where you put your treasure can shape your heart. Um, uh, Mark Allen Powell, who got me thinking about this the most in his book, Loving Jesus, said that he had a gal come to him, and he'd never had this happen, and at, said to him, uh, Pastor, I want to love God more. How do I do that? And he said, I was flummoxed. I didn't know what to tell. I'd never been asked this. And he says, now, though, what he would say to her is give God more. Where you put your treasure, there your heart will be. If you feel you want to love God more, give God more. So you can dictate where your heart is, what you care about, by where you put your treasure. Now, that's kind of cool. That's pretty exciting. Um, so, um, do you think sometimes treasure isn't money? It's, it's time. What's our biggest treasure? It's family, it's treasure. Sure. Time, treasure, um, talents. But yeah, your family is your treasure. Your house is your treasure. Your relationships are your treasure. Um, you know, and so yeah. But where you put that, and I think time is the biggest one like what you guys are doing right here you know what do most people say i don't have the time yeah my mom i'll never forget my mom telling me after she retired so she ran a business her whole life worked her tail off and she oftentimes the church would call and say mary can you do this and she just said i don't have to and that was certainly true but when she retired she said you know what bill that was an excuse mm -hmm. I had time. I could have made time to do some of those things. But if it, she did have to be. Oh, sure. And she, it wasn't like she didn't do anything, but she, you know, and I think about that today, how often we're told we don't have time when people are watching an average of, I think it's four hours a day of TV. The average person watches. If you have four hours. Yeah, the is the worst. Oh, you know, the tablet. But if you, if we have time to binge watch whatever Netflix thing, can I, I binge watch something oh, yeah, too? I've been doing some, I love Masterpiece Theater. 
But anyway, so, um, you know, so I, I spend time watching TV and chilling out, but at the same time, you know, we have time. It's, it's our, and so where I put my time, so that might be a devotional thing. Like, instead of doing this, I'm going to study the scriptures. I'm going to read my Bible a little more. And I put my treasure there. And what happens to my heart? My heart starts to love God more. So um, a lot of times people think we are slaves to what our heart desires. We can shape what our heart desires. So, well, the thing people should the Bible, but something else <clears throat> that God loves a cheerful giver. Sure. Yeah. First Corinthians. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember my mother's uh, dad saying that I was a member of the church that they used to belong to the man that I can never give away more than what God gives me. Yeah, and I know what I just kept, you know, he was yeah. just giving it. He would give it away. Yeah, I've heard so many people say that. I haven't outgiven God yet. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a real test of faith. Mm -hmm. I'm a person of little faith. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've tried it as much as I should. But, yeah. um, My mother told me something a few years, several years ago that stayed with me. And um, this was when he was kind of newly getting back into church. And he's, he's in the Baptist church and very, he's flourishing there. His family flourishes. And um, he said that he had a role when he changed about mundane tasks in his life, like mowing the lawn and, um, you know, his kids were flipping hamburgers. And, but um, I had to look up the verse that said first um, that um, everything you do, you do for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. So these things that maybe aren't even God, um, you know, like mowing your lawn isn't giving yeah. to God, but if your heart is face towards God, what are you doing? Like, I'm going to mow the best lawn I can you know, for the glory of God. He said that was really important. Yeah. His mindset. Right? I'm flipping these burgers for God. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so you do a good job. You clean up after yourself. You, yeah. You know. Yeah, absolutely. You go the extra mile. Go the extra mile. Yeah. It makes me think of what you used to tell the kids um, when they were supposed to pick up their toys. I would always tell them, okay, that's, it's like weeds in the garden. So you got to weed the garden for Jesus. And then, yeah. Of picking up this device. Yeah. And it seemed to work. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Very cool. So we are going to, I will have to, um, hey, Ann, sorry to bother you. Did you remember, do they, do they start up at quarter till over there, that closing? Do you remember? Okay. Can you just check, check the schedule real quick so I can remember when I have to be open? Um, so you, yeah, this is great. Well, shall we keep going? Yeah. Yeah. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like people who are waiting for our men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once. Okay, thank you. Um, open the door at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So be ready. Um, <laughs> yes. That um, makes me think of the ten virgins, you know. Yes. You don't have your lamp oil. Yeah. Yep. Makes me think of the song, Keep yeah. Your Lamps Trimmed and Burned. Yeah. Keep Your Lamps. And we sing for Advent sometimes. Um, there's a switch here, though. What master comes and, and serves the servants? Does that happen? Here's an image of Jesus, the master, being the servant. Didn't he wash the disciples' feet in the Gospel of John? So he takes on the servant. 
side of things. Um, he will dress himself for service and have them recline a table and will come and serve them. Um, so this 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 little second watch or third and finds him awake, bless her, those are the, the Roman night was divided into these watches, I believe. Um, so you know, don't don't tire. And isn't this a challenge for us um, who are 2,000 years after Jesus, who said, I'm coming soon. It's a challenge for us to stay ready, isn't it? To keep that intensity. It is for, I'll speak for myself. Um, I mentioned as we, as when we started this study that I really believe Luke is the gospel for the long haul. That Luke had a particular concern that the church Many of his of Jesus' followers that he was writing for were thrown in the towel. Hey, Jesus said he's going to come soon, and yet now people have died, and it's just dragging on. And you know, and they're like, maybe we got this wrong. And so Luke really hones his writing in for people in that situation. And here's a great passage from Jesus that says, "Look, and he may not come until the very end of the night, um, but stay ready." Um, and, and it's going to happen when you don't expect it. Well, this, it's just like, we don't know when we're going to die. Yeah, yeah. We don't know when we're going to die, which is really the end. You know, that's when, to me, I think that's when we're at the end. But um, liter not just the, our literal end, but that it will be at the eschaton. That's just the way I think about it. But nonetheless, um, at an hour you do not expect. So here's my, again, my soapbox on when Jesus comes again. Why do we put so much energy in trying to figure it out? <laughs> he said, he's going to come at a time you do not expect. If we figure it out and it works, it's not, that's not, what, what, what part do Christians don't get about this? I don't understand. He's, it's going to be a surprise. If you don't like surprises, that's your problem. But you know, if you don't like a surprise birthday party, that's fine. But you're going to get one once in a while. So, yeah, period. All these groups over the years, yeah. particularly the end of the earth, you know, end of the world, yeah. many times over the years, never happened. Yeah, exactly. And then their followers all get disillusioned and, yeah. you know, fall away. <laughs> so, but it's kind of like, you know, I mean, my brother, Lutherans are not, don't, we don't get too wrapped up in this. And maybe we should get more wrapped up in it. We should have more expectation, you know, like even though it's going to come and you don't expect, we, you know, be ready. It could be any minute because that's the truth. But, you know, some of our other brothers and sisters in Christ are so focused on this sign is this. Oh, it's this is coming. We've got, I've got it figured out. How Lindsay started it in our, you know, Israel was formed and now it's one generation after the formation of Israel and late great planet Earth. And he, of course, no. Just read Revelation in it. And, right, exactly. So but maybe yet, if they stop expecting it, it can happen sooner. Exactly. That's my point, Doug. I'm not so sure Jesus isn't up there ready to go. Like, I'm coming. Oh, he figured it out again. I'm just waiting. I want to come. You guys keep saying Maranatha, but then you're like, you figure out when I'm coming. So I got, it's going to be a surprise. Yeah, it's true. He doesn't even know. All right. I didn't eat that nut. So I got to go play my guitar. Yeah. So we have to finish early. If you came in late, no Bible study next week. I have to be at the Bernhardt grave song. So let's pray. Thank you, God, for this great study today. Um, be with us as we move through the summer and, and just continue to keep us in your word, um, that we can truly be blessed as we hear your word and keep it in Jesus' name. Right, thanks, everybody. Joyce, you keep getting better. We're praying for you.